thank you all for coming out today and allowing us to share a story with the community and updating them. There's been a lot of attention to a shooting that occurred on March 6, just a few days ago at one of our Broward County transit stations. Uh, and we wanna make sure we give you the facts about what occurred out there as it was an active killer incident and our deputies respond and was able to help mitigate that threat. So a couple things we're gonna do here today. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through the timeline the best that I can so you can have an understanding of how the sequence of events occurred. Then we're gonna play a video from one of our body worn cameras showing you the activities of the deputies on scene arriving up and dealing with this threat. Let me begin with this. Uh, this call came out roughly about 11.25 p.m. So we're talking about in the late evening hours. And I'm gonna paint the story for you. Uh, we had a suspect, an employee of the county government who apparently arrived on scene, was in the working capacity at some point, and roughly about 11.18, uh, before shots were fired, we can look at the video footage from the secure site uh, on the county's property and see that the individual goes into a locker room of some sort, he changes out his clothes, he's now in his civilian attire, and he's just basically waiting, um, or what we are referencing as ambushing, prepping to execute um, killing one of his colleagues. And for roughly three or four minutes, we can see this suspect standing outside of this room with a lunchbox in his hand. And at some point, at a roughly 11.25, he removes a firearm from that lunchbox and the victim comes outside of the room and he executes the victim. He fires multiple shots at point blank range, puts the victim down. As you can imagine, this creates an enormous amount of chaos for that work environment. Some employees were able to witness it or capture the tail end of it. They're seeing their colleague walking around through these hallways, roaming, going in from one room into the next, went into another break room, guns still exposing his hands, people took off in panic and running, and an appropriate response. That's what we want to see. We want to see our people run, hide, or fight and avoid having any type of conflict or being engaged. And it was roughly around four or so minutes um, before we got that first call, so to speak. The first 911 call came out at, looks like 2327, 1127. So not a lot of time spent from the time that the shots was fired, a victim was killed, and then we were getting the 911 calls from members inside of the county facility, and we started dispatching and sending our deputies out uh, to help mitigate that threat. Throughout the duration of that response, our deputies are en route, we're traveling on scene. We looked at the video uh, footage, and the suspect, as you can, we can see, is formulating, contemplating, further planning about what his next move was going to be. Uh, we witnessed him pull a hammer out and destroy his cell phone. We witnessed him walk and strategically pace, place himself in an ambush position inside of a bus that was vacant, being prepared and waiting and waiting for our deputies or the next victim to cross his path. Our deputies got on scene within three minutes of that first 911 call and being dispatched. Uh, and we believe that it was the sirens and the multitude of deputies arriving on scene that possibly played into the suspect putting himself inside of that bus. We witnessed shortly after that, as our deputies are now in a slow probe, tracking, trying to find out where this shooter is, we witnessed him come outside of the bus when he sees our deputies and open fire. He fired roughly six rounds at our deputies. Three of our deputies that were on scene were able to exchange gunfire and eliminate and neutralize that threat. That's the first part um, in which I want to speak about. We have had our share of active shooter events here in this county. We've learned some hard lessons. Uh, we have focused as an organization to advance the training and equipment protocols and everything else to make sure we're prepared for this. And we continue to see the benefits that this community gained by such training and investments. Uh, the other thing I want to add, more for community awareness. Um, I listened to all the 911 calls that came through. Uh, and I want to give some of those civilians who made those calls um, an applaud and say, well done. Uh, throughout that chaos and all that panic and all that fright and uncertainty, members of this community, members of the uh, Broward County government and that works in the transit unit, maintained themselves on the phones, provided you know, viable information and help us get to that threat. So that was excellent. But there's also some points of interest that I want to point out, just me being an instructor and always looking to coach and train and teach people up is that our local businesses, whether it be government, private sector, you must continue to take on some form of educational training on how to mitigate these active shooter threats. As an organization, we provide and support our local businesses and government. Um, so if there's any need for anyone out there to take some advanced training, whether it be the traditional national model of run, hide, fight, 
or BCON or bleeding control training programs, take advantage of them. Something I also want to share with the community is pay attention to your work environments. If you see something, say something, but more importantly, know precisely your work location address. Listening to the 911 calls, we're going to pull them up, we're going to figure it out, but remember, you're calling from your cell phones. And the more solid information you can provide us, something as simple as the actual address where you work, which we all should know, make sure you understand where you are at all times, whether it be a business or a movie theater or whatever it is, because when bad things happen and you start dialing 911, there's going to be an interrogation process that take place with our dispatchers to make sure they get it right. So the more solid information you can give us, the more expedient our response will be. What I wanna do now is just pause, and I'm gonna put, put this in context first so you understand what you're about to witness. Um, the call has already been placed, the shots has already been fired, dispatchers are pumping out our deputies out to the site location, and this is one of our deputies who were actually shot at and returned fire and engaged um, with this individual. This is his body-worn camera. A multitude of deputies are already on scene. It's a quiet environment. It's a stale environment, meaning there's no live gunfire. There's no indicators as which direction should they go and which direction should they pursue a suspect in. So we're slow probing. We're moving fast. You're going to see our people running. And then finally, as our team is moving up into a bay area where all the buses are located and the suspect is locked down and fortified in that environment, you're gonna witness our deputies pivot to their left after they receive about six gunfires from the suspect, return gunfire, and then move into close contact to make sure they can secure the scene. So Ron, we'll go ahead and play that for them and then we'll start taking some questions afterwards. Give it about 30 seconds, folks. That's standard with our body-worn cameras before you get audio. Uh, there's just a sequence of time. As they're in route per policy, they activate their cameras and once they get out the car, you'll start hearing the live audio. So that concludes the body worn camera video. Again, I wish we could share other different video footage, but that property does not belong to us. It belongs to the county, and there are certain statutory restrictions in terms of confidentiality and security elements. With that, I'll turn it over to you all for some questions. It, it's, I would say, somewhat typical with some active shooter cases that's taken place across the country. Some uh, initiate in terms of being some vindictive approach for one single individual, and then we've seen them just compound and become worse. Uh, people at that point decide that they're going to just shoot everything in sight. Fortunately, uh, the employees inside responded effective to where they separated themselves from that environment. Uh, a few were still kind of in shock and floating around, and we can, we're going to coach up the county government on what we think they should do better. Um, but most certainly, it, having law enforcement respond very fast, it takes out the suspect's ability to determine the outcomes. And I think we've seen and witnessed enough active shooter events across the country and even in this county where there's a hesitation either in the response, there's not enough aggressiveness to get to those site locations as fast as you can and take the fight to those individuals. Um, I, I've said this publicly, I'll say it again. Uh, make no mistake, this is the only legitimate kill mission we have in law enforcement. No one's expecting us to come there and negotiate with someone who's gunning down individual, individuals, whether it be in a business or a school or a mosque or a church. We have to get there, and the most effective means to stop that threat is to eliminate it so that we can get back to treating the injured, securing the environments, and everything else. Uh, there's a lot involved in that. One, I think the consistency in our training and, and how we're training our personnel to move swiftly as fast as they can. There's two prongs when we're talking about stopping an active shooter. The first is stopping the killing and stopping the dying. 
stopping and killing, the imperative nature of that is what I said in the onset, getting to that suspect and putting that suspect down. So that then we can go into attack, med care, treat and injure, extractions and all the other things. That's part of our standard training. Um, I think also there's a, a important side of relationships uh, that his sergeant was running point and he's worked with his sergeant. He was one of our crime suppression team members. So they're a more tight, smaller net group that are used to doing these tactics and training all the time. Uh, and then seeing the flood of probably another half a dozen plus deputies in that stack that was gonna have to spread out and clear that massive environment. Um, we were fortunate in the sense that um, the separation and distance between the shooter and the weapon platform that he particularly had in this case allowed us the ability to adjust quickly and, and put the suspect down. It was inside. So there's two kind of, it's one crime scene, but let me just give you some clarity, Marissa. So there's an indoor component, of course, where there's office spacing, locker rooms, et cetera. At 1118, it appeared that, and I'm not sure if he was on duty or not, but the suspect at the time changed out of his mechanics uniform and put on civilian attire. He comes out of what I'm referring to as a locker room. It could be a conference room where they're using change and I haven't been in it. He comes out in civilian attire, he's holding a lunch box and he's waiting. It's crystal clear he's waiting. He waited for quite some time for his colleague to change out and come out in his clothes and then he shot and executed him. But that's what that happened outside the actual shooting. It happened with, no, that is that inside the facility if I paint in two segments, you have a facility and then you have a bay area. The execution and the first shooting that took place was inside of the building. Plus. Yeah, one of the things we witnessed in the video footage, uh, you can see there's some contemplation going on. Where should I go? Who should I shoot next? Where's my next move? Uh, and he t finds a hammer and just, a, it's, a, it's a work site and crushes his own cell phone. So that's one of those indicators for us is like, is there some type of evidence that he was looking to destroy? Our investigators will do their best to retrieve whatever information they can from that phone. But as that happens, he goes onto the bus. He's, he's loading up on that bus as our deputies are looking for him. Yeah, he's, he, he didn't kind of step out. Um, and this is one of the things where, uh, this is one of these videos where I would love to give you every bit of it to see how severe this could have been and how deadly intended this individual was. Uh, most people, when officers are arriving on scene, statistically would act as shooters, they commit suicide. They're cowards. They don't want to get in a fight. He made his mind up that he was going to die that day or kill as many people, including law enforcement. There's over a half a dozen plus uh, officers on that scene that he fired at. We don't know just yet. It's, it's still too early. Uh, you know, our investigators are going to have to take witness statements uh, to include that of both the victim and suspect family members to try to figure out what was like the precept for this. Uh, but ultimately, from an investigative standpoint, it really doesn't matter. Uh, we had an individual who stepped in unprovoked. Uh, pre-planned and executed a colleague and then decided that he was going to kill about a half a dozen law enforcement officers. So I'm glad we took the fight to him and we came out victorious on that one. How many shots did he fire? I believe he fired six and we returned 49. Uh, most certainly a combination of whatever comments were made as our deputies was running by was, was helpful, but also the calls that were coming in and people inside trying their best to identify precisely where the shooting had took place. Um, I think just collectively knowing that our Pompano district does a very good job learning the environments and site locations, patrolling, getting out on foot, we had an advantage in that that facility as massive as it was, we had a pretty clear indicator of where to go to in terms of where the bays were located with the buses and that's why you saw that push to contact as we call it flowing through that chamber to get to the suspect. No, not to my understanding, nothing else came up. Uh, I haven't heard of anyone being hit other than the suspect. I, I can tell you, I don't know a great deal about his background. Investigators will, will dive into that. For the interest of the story, you probably will want more, but for us, it doesn't really matter. Uh, th this guy came in here, again, unprovoked, killed an innocent person for whatever the quarrel may have been or may not have been, and then decided, I don't know for a fact, my deputies didn't do anything to him, but he decided he wanted to kill them too. That's what it looked like. And we'll, once we get more intel, that's something that we wouldn't mind sharing with you um, so long as it doesn't impact anything. But that's what it looks like on the video footage, kind of that changing of the guard, half the staff is leaving, some are changing before they go home. Uh, and then uh, the shooter decided that this was an opportune time for him to wait and catch this victim because it, watching the whole sequence of the things pan out, the victim had no idea this was coming. They're doing well. Um, I called them up each as I normally do and, and talked to them and let them know I've seen the video. 
I've witnessed the nature of the threat that uh, was posed against them, and they did a remarkable job. I'll say this right now before it even gets to the point. I intend to put the Medal of Honor around all three of their necks. It's the most courageous thing I've seen. Sure, three of our, three of our deputies in, uh, that were involved in the shooting, one uh, was the crime, scene, uh, excuse me, crime suppression team sergeant, uh, Noel Mer Mercado. He's 44 years of age. He's been with the organization for 22 years. Um, spent some time on our SWAT team. I've been with him on operations. He's an outstanding operator, and he's an exceptional supervisor for us. Uh, two of the deputies that were also engaged in the shooting were somewhat rookies, uh, the first of which was Deputy Joseph Sherbo, 31 years of age. He's been with us four years. I can remember just swearing him in uh, not too long ago. Uh, and then our third deputy excuse me, that was involved was Deputy, deputy Richard uh, Delaguio. 30 years of age, we just hired him on January 17th of 2023. So I appreciate seeing a combination of both veteran officers who have the skill set um, and the right temperament to execute these things, but it's also nice to see that the young people that we are in investing in and training and giving them the most modern tactics and techniques and equipment are out here executing and getting the job done.